All right. Uh, good evening. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, how we use Kafka and Kafka Streams in the Global Shipstead Data Platform. So um, my name is uh, Fredrik Rolsen, and I also brought a colleague, uh, Håkon Andal, in the front here. We're both uh, data engineers in the data platform team of Shipstead Products and Technology. We both joined uh, last September, and the uh, reason why I joined at least was to get to work with all these cool technologies, working on fun and interesting problems. So we use Scala and Kafka and Apache Spark for batch processing and stuff, and we run everything on, on Amazon Web Services. So you got some information or some background on Shipstead earlier, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But uh, Shipstead consists, as you saw, uh, primarily of these three kind of areas, media houses, marketplaces, and growth companies. Uh, the, those are the kind of new up-and-coming companies. Um, a couple of years ago, they realized that we're building a lot of similar services and components across of all of these companies. So they started uh, Shipstead Products and Technology, um, which is located in different uh, hubs uh, across Europe. And uh, what we do there is to build different platforms and components to support these different uh, companies. So we have pla uh, platforms for publishing in marketplaces, for example, and for uh, advertisement. Um, and we have several common components that we see are used in, all, uh, in a lot of different sites. So for identity, login, payment solutions, messaging, and so on. Um, and the team that I'm working in is down here in the data and analytics part of the organization, so enabling technologies. All right. Um, so before I get started on Kafka and such, I just wanted to give you so to sort of take you on a little trip back about a year or so when we started and describe what things were like then. Um, so we have a data pipeline that we use. Um, so we have a lot of events coming in from all of our different sites, from both web and mobile. And we have this <coughs> component called Collector, which uh, collects all these events, aptly named, um, like clicks on websites and, and different engage engagement events and so on. And we also have a lot of different backend services that send us events, things like uh, payment events, new users or user changes, uh, new content data, for example, uh, updated uh, classified ads or, or new uh, newspaper articles and things like that. And um, so we ingest this in our collector, and we store this in a Kinesis stream. This is our event files, and this is what we use for sort of our initial ingestion stable storage. And from this, we then had a storage, uh, another uh, microservice basically, called storage, which took these events and wrote them down to stable storage in S3. Uh, Amazon S3 is, the, is their sort of distributed uh, persistent file, st file system. And then the data goes along two different paths. We have our batch processing layer, which is used by different uh, analysis teams to do uh, like uh, machine learning things and um, processes and th stuff like that on all of these events. And we have our real-time pipeline, streaming pipeline. So this is the focus uh, today, basically, this, this part of it. This is what we're going to talk about. So... Um, when I started a little over a year ago, uh, this was the picture. So we had this thing, taking the events from Kinesis, storing them in S3 in micro-batches, and then we had this other, our own little homegrown uh, stream processing solution called Piper, which took these events, or micro-batches of events, and processed them, and basically did like simple filtering transformations and distributed them to various downstream consumers. And we integrated with different kinds of syncs, so we supported writing back to other Kinesis streams for other consumers to, to read from. Uh, also storing in S3 for those that you wanted to read from there. And we supported, uh, for example, Cassandra for uh, NoSQL storage. All right, so in this platform, we process... Each day, so this is taken from last week, the a number of incoming uh, events from the different sites and so on. So each day we process around 800 million events, so we like to call that medium data, with aspirations of becoming big, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, so as you can see, uh, so all of these events come in from all our different sites across the world and uh, get collected into this one data platform. And as you can see, the load varies a lot during the day, right? You have these huge peaks around 9 p.m. in the evening when people are reading newspapers and going online to shop for stuff on the classified ads uh, marketplaces and stuff like that. 
So these are some of the things we need to handle. So the issues with the setup that we had, so to recap those, is that first of all, the, the solution we had had, some, from a technical side of uh, point of view, it had a fairly high latency of around 30 seconds for, from we got the amount in on our ingest endpoint to it was shipped to our downstream consumers. Now, 30 seconds might be okay for some use cases, but if you're tracking a user as it's walking or moving around a website and you want to give them updated uh, uh, suggestions, for example, for what to read or uh, targeted ads, then this might be too long. They will move away from your website or to another part of it completely before, before this event comes, uh, gets down to the ad layer, for example. We also had some issues with um, delivery guarantees because all of our different syncs were sort of in the same process, so they were not independent. So if one sync was slow or was having issues, that affected the other ones as well. So we had to implement things like hysterics to, to sort of have short circuiting uh, of, um, so if some of the syncs were slow or, or failing, then they would basically just drop sending events to them. Well, that's not good because they probably still wanted those events maybe, right? But we didn't have this, this feature of uh, being able to sort of process in, in uh, different speed for the different consumers. Um, from a more organizational point of view, uh, onboarding of new consumers and stuff was a very sort of uh, manual process which involved our team. So we're, uh, the data platform team has six people in it currently. We're growing to seven in a couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, but it, we were sort of a, like a, a bottleneck, our team, basically, for onboarding new consumers onto this platform. And there was a lot of manual configuration as well in like JSON files. So there was ample uh, ways for, for or, uh, different ways for us to, to mess up, basically, and, and deploy something that didn't work properly. And we have uh, incidents and people getting woken up in the middle of the night and so on. And finally, of course, this is a homegrown solution. So we had to build everything and maintain everything ourselves, right? So this is what we, that, this was the situation and what we sort of wanted to get, get away from. Mm. Now, we had several people, uh, or to begin with, there's me and, and one other person on the team who had uh, a lot of experience with uh, Kafka from beforehand. So, you know, we, and we saw some needs for, for uh, changing this, this stream platform. So we sat down about a year ago and started building a vision for where we wanted to go. And so the, the main goal is for Shipstead to become, uh, all of Shipstead to become a data-driven organization. So we wanted to make it easier to create data-driven applications on top of our data platform. And in order to sort of facilitate this, we needed uh, more self-serve for our users. We wanted them to be able to register new data sets, to be able to register new downstream consumers, and what kind of uh, transformations they want to do, and so on. And like, uh, uh, currently we, we manually handle all of the routing and things like that. So we wanted to automate and do this in a self-serve fashion so they can just go to a website and register what they want, right? Um, as probably anyone who's working on data processing now knows that we have this thing called a GDPR that we also need to worry about. <laughs> so that's also coming into the, uh, to the picture here, right? And there were, of course, these performance things that we noticed, right? There, we had a much higher latency that we, than we wanted, and, and uh, we didn't have a uh, good, good delivery guarantees, and we can sort of handle different syncs uh, working in a, or processing stuff in, in a, their own pace, at their own pace. And finally, we wanted to, instead of maintaining and building everything on our own, we wanted to build on state-of-the-art open source and existing components as much as possible. So, we ended up with Silicon Kafka, and, and so the question is, why, why Kafka, and why not, for example, Kinesis? We were already using Kinesis for, for stream processing, and that was our main ingestion um, fire, event firehose. And Kinesis works very well for that. We've had this set up for a long time, and it's battle-tested. It works very well. We have failover to different regions in AWS and so on. Um, but there are some drawbacks with Kinesis that we wanted to sort of get away from. One of them is, uh, from a more technical point of view, there's uh, issues with scalability in terms of number of consumers. You only get twice the output bandwidth as you have input bandwidth configured, basically. So you can't scale with as many consumers as you want. 
So adding new microservices to consume the same data, that means you actually have to scale the entire stream up. And that's costly. And also, Kinesis by default only stores data for 24 hours. Uh, you can extend that to seven days, I believe. That costs more, obviously. Currently, in our, in our current streaming process, uh, set, stream processing setup, we only store data for 24 hours anyway, but we at least have the possibility now to store data for how lo however long we want, and we already have requests for storing data longer for to be able to do things like reprocessing, for example. Uh, yeah, and as been mentioned here before, uh, Kafka is sort of the, the de facto standard for stream processing now, and we have good experience with it, and other teams we talked with in ships that also had a lot of experience with running Kafka. So, okay, so we chose Kafka as a, sort of our basis, but so what, we do, what then with stream processing itself? So we started surveying the landscape there, and uh, you know, fans, fortunately there are a lot of options. Uh, so we looked at some of these, uh, in particular, since we were already using Spark for batch processing, we looked at Spark streaming, and things like Apache Flink. Um, the main reason why we ended up with Kafka is that it was very, as uh, Kai mentioned earlier, it's just a library. It's very lightweight. You can just deploy it as a regular Java application. Uh, if you saw our graph, right, we want to be able to scale up and down easily as the uh, traffic changes during the day. And with Kafka, that was just uh, in, in AWS, we were just running our Kafka streams applications as regular Amazon compute nodes, and you could just add and remove nodes as the load increases. Or change it. So the deployment wise, it was easy. It supports auto scaling, sort of auto, out of the box. Whereas, for example, running Apache Flink or Spark Streaming, you would typically have some cluster set up of fixed size with cluster management software and things like that. All right. So we ended up choosing Kafka Streams. It was fairly new at the time. It had been out for, I guess, half a year or so. But it seemed uh, to fit our needs pretty, pretty well. We, what most of what we do is pretty simple. We do filtering transformations. We send the data down to various downstream consumers with some transformations along the way to do things like uh, we're working on things like uh, GDPR compliance, or we want to have data minimization, for example. Right? We want to send as little data as possible to to the consumers. So, back in February, our new project streaming uh, platform was born called Igdrasil. We have a tendency to name things after Norse mythology, so uh, <laughs> um, it, was, it was kind of uh, inspired by this sort of uh, our event, fire hoses the trunk, and then we spread the data out to different consumers in the branches, and doing filtering and transformations and stuff along the way. Um, so our old shipping pipeline, if you remember, was something like this, and our new one is uh, now we walked out this micro batch thing storage in S3 with Kafka, basically. And we replaced this homegrown solution uh, that we had with Kafka Streams and this Yggdrasil application. We still had some of the same uh, issues in terms of sending data to downstream consumers because uh, we most of the teams we collaborate with run on AWS. So we wanted really to uh, leverage the AWS security model in terms of uh, authentication and, and identity management and stuff like that. So that's why we support sending data to uh, Kinesis and S3 and, and SQS, for example, because that allows us to, for teams that are running different accounts and stuff like that, we can easily use the, the mechanisms in, a, in Amazon Cloud all, that are already there. But we also have added uh, a lot of other different things that we support in our in our system, uh, depending on what the different consumers need. So, for example, we have uh, support for sending data to Elasticsearch. We've added various sort of analytics uh, systems as downstream consumers, and we're working on uh, moving. So we're still running uh, some stuff on our old solution. So we're working moving that over and adding things like Cassandra support. And also, at some point, we will actually get give people access directly to our Kafka topics, but right now we don't have the security model set up for that properly. So getting data in and out. Uh, Kai already talked about this Kafka Connect tool that was there. So we, we looked at that and um, we already had a lot of code to talk to these different systems from our old uh, solution. 
And we decided basically, you know, the, the alternative was either use Connect or, or write our own thing. So we, we ended up doing basically that. We ended up writing basic producers and consumers to just uh, move data. We already had code to move data from Kinesis to things. And so we could move data from Kinesis to Kafka pretty easily. And the same from Kafka to other uh, downstream consumers. It gave us a bit more control. And we already, as I said, had more, uh, had existing code for a lot of this. And it's not, not really very complex stuff. I mean, most of the consumers are uh, one page of code. Right? It's just doing an HTTP call. And we're handling like reach eye logic and stuff common for all of the different uh, consumers. Um, this also fit very well with our runtime environment with the auto scaling in groups in, in Amazon and stuff like that. So they're basically, all our connectors are basically simple microservices themselves. Um, I mentioned these, these third party analytics tools because we, one of the things is that we have our own tracking solution called Pulse that takes uh, click events and, and tracking events from the websites and the apps uh, and, and feeds into our, our analytics tools. But we also, the sites wanted also to use other analytics tools that they, they were for some reason, like uh, Amplitude, for example. Um, and what this allowed us to do was also then take, to write a connector for that. So instead of having to add the amplitude trackers to the website as well, in addition to our own one, uh, so we, we have sites that have several trackers on them because of these kind of different integrations. We could take our, our pulse data and send it also through some transformation layer to, uh, to Amplitude. So that removed the need for multiple trackers on some of our sites, right? Now we've negotiated deals with this. So, so we're not using the regular Amplitude web uh, tracker for this. So we're just sending directly to their uh, REST API, basically. But it, this has allowed us to do some very easy, quick onboarding of, uh, of sites onto this new platform, which has been a very quick win for us. Another thing we have built on top of this is uh, tools to do uh, data quality analysis. So um, we've built the Kafka Streams application to, that takes all of these events as they come in, or a subset of them, and does analysis of uh, the quality of uh, them. Do they match the, the specified schema, for example? The sites, we're, we're sending JSON, so there's no sort of real guarantees that the sites have done this correctly. So we have various tests here. And what this, this uh, data quality tooling has uh, allows people to submit their own tests. So the different downstream consumers can, for example, say, we expect this event to look like this. And they can submit test work. So, so now we have tests from many different uh, uh, teams, basically. We have about 100 tests running per event right now which are submitted by different teams into this, this com common beta quality tool. Um, yeah, we also have a, a other kind of data-driven applications that we've built on top of this. So we, instead, in addition to having this just be our, like our, our streaming uh, processing platform, we also built this as sort of a platform for new uh, applications. So what we've done is sort of build a, a little uh, overlay on top of Kafka Streams. Uh, our own sort of sample application, basically, that people can clone from GitHub and then get started writing their own data-driven application uh, using Kafka Streams, but also getting a bunch of stuff for free. Uh, so we're using, uh, we're giving them things like health checks and other integrations into the sort of uh, Shipstead ecosystem. Um, and we also have written some, some additional layers to make it easier and nicer to use from Scala, for example, which is the language we are using mostly. So the kind of examples of things that we have built, or other teams have built, actually, not us, uh, yeah. mostly, is things like experiments analysis, uh, analysis tools for A-B testing and other kinds of experiments. Uh, uh, location enrichment, Holcomb here has been working on that uh, to take the events as they come in and do enrichment of location information based on IP addresses. Um, there's been uh, image uh, featureization, uh, sort of like, Deep, uh, deep uh, learning kind of uh, application building on on, uh, on these content events coming in. And we have another application or a system doing message intent uh, exploration. So in, in a conversation, for example, in between two traders in a classified site, you can analyze the messages as they come in and try to give the users more uh, sort of uh, appropriate actions depending on what state they are in. Now, this application hasn't been built yet, but a lot of the underlying <laughs> stuff is there, the message intent analysis. 
So we've built this platform that sort of opens up for collaboration with different teams and, and allows us to build a sort of common, uh, build solutions but on a com common platform, basically. Now, to some of the sort of the, the bad stuff that we've gone through, right? We've had some growing pains. Um, when we set this thing up this spring, basically, we were just setting up some test streams and not really having anything in production yet. So we started moving the first couple of things into production uh, after the summer break, like the beginning of August, I believe. And then things basically took off before we were ready, really. <laughs> we were like, okay, we have three consumers, downstream consumers right now, but we still have time to do some tinkering and getting things working properly. Uh, but within three weeks, we had doubled the amount of traffic on our Kafka cluster, and we were not able to handle it, basically. So we tried, we, we needed to scale up fast. Um, so a lot of things were added here in this time frame. We had like our ad platform was coming in here. We were preparing the data for them. We had uh, some of the, the largest media sites were moving onto this solution as well. Uh, Engage, which you are working on, was moved onto this. Um, so we had a lot of stuff suddenly moving through this platform before we were kind of ready for it. Um, so if you plan for success, be prepared to scale fast. <laughs> um, our plan was first to add additional brokers because Kafka is, can do this, right? You can just add more brokers to get more bandwidth. Uh, so we did that, and we started moving data over, and we moved from six to nine brokers. Uh, but before we kind of finished moving data across, we realized that we were still in trouble because we were too close to the bandwidth and, and I.O. Uh, limits and so on. So we decided instead of just adding these nine, we added we changed to a totally different Amazon instance for all of our Kafka brokers. And this new Amazon instance, we moved from one called D2 to one called I3, which came out in March, I think, or something. And this one has basically twice the amount of memory and CPU, but more importantly, it has SSD disks instead of rotating hardware. Uh, and, and it had 15 times the bandwidth. So <laughs> much more apt for Kafka. So. Uh, so in, this, in the mid, well, first half of October, we finished moving everything over there, but this was not sort of a smooth ride. Uh, we had so many issues. Uh, first of all, it was kind of uh, on our part. We were trying to move data over, but we were trying to do it too fast. We didn't know that we were reached that close to the limit. So we started moving data over, and then suddenly CPU usage, like, okay, regular traffic went down, and then the... the, the <coughs> Machine was only reading stuff like from the disk, right? It's trying to reprocess everything and uh, everything ground to a halt. Uh, we hit various kind of bugs in Kafka as well uh, in the release we were on then because we had moved to 0.11 at that time, uh, the first release, uh, to, to sort of get over some bugs in Kafka streams that we had hit. But it turned out we hit some bugs in Kafka itself instead. So. We had things like, uh, suddenly we had a lot of under-replicated and, and unavailable uh, partitions and topics, which is bad, because that what happens to the traffic zone is like, everything dies. Our main firehose in just the stream died, <laughs> basically. Um, and so yeah, so latency spiked, and no, no, no one got their events, and, and so on. But the good thing about this is, the data that's there was safe. And, and uh, we had already this, so we had kind of planned for this, you know, we were still in the process of setting things up. So we had this Kinesis stream uh, before Kafka. So as soon as we got things up and running again, we were able to process and catch up. So that, that was pretty quick. So whenever we then got things up and running, we could do this kind of spike of processing and we could then uh, easily just scale up all of the uh, processing applications, right? Because they were just regular Amazon auto-scaling groups. So whenever they got the spike of traffic, they would just scale up as normal and handle the, the spike of incoming events. So I think the main issue, we, main thing we learned here is, uh, first of all, I mean, you're, if you're on the bleeding edge, it's going to hurt, <laughs> a little bit at least. Um, we should should have waited maybe for uh, the first bug fix release before moving to 0 0.11. But we, at the time, we didn't really think we were that close to having stuff in real production, right? So we did it a bit prematurely. The other thing is uh, be open about this and do real communication with your downstream consumers. They will appreciate it, right? Be open about the issues and they will understand and 
you can work, uh, work them out. So, as I mentioned, so we, uh, our, our experiences with this is that, yeah, we, we hit some bugs in Kafka. Uh, 0 0.11, I think, was probably not the best release of Kafka. There, were, uh, there have been a number of things like deadlocks and things that we've hit, which is not good for this kind of system. Uh, partly it was also because of our inexperience with running specifically Kafka streams, right? This is a new library, so we needed to learn how to use it. We had several sort of uh, failed attempts at writing applications, uh, which we tried to put too much stuff into one application, and that had various different interesting failure modes. But we learned, and we split things. So we <laughs> we basically ended up, you know, writing microservices instead of having one big application, which is a good thing. So the the good outcome of this is that we have amassed a lot of knowledge on on and know-how on, on operating Kafka and writing Kafka apps. So I just did some maths yesterday trying to look at this. So even with all of the kind of issues we had, uh, in all of October we had two and a half hours of downtime. So that's 99.5% uptime. It's still pretty good, right? We're not doing kind of, it, it's not life and death kind of issue here. It's kind of mission critical for some things, but if you have some downtime, it's not that important. And we did have some durability issues, so we managed almost six nines delivery of events. But we're still, we aren't really set up for having guaranteed delivery of everything. So I think this is still a pretty good number for the kind of things we saw. And in the week since we actually, what we did is we deployed a self-compiled uh, or assembled version of Kafka, with which we pulled in some bug fixes from the upcoming release. And in the week since, well, actually, that's false because we had an incident earlier today. But uh, in the week after, we had no downtime. But today, we had a different time. Uh, I was on the plane, so I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah. I mentioned self-serve. So we have this vision of self-serve, right? We want our, our consumers, our, uh, down, uh, our users, to be able to deal with uh, a lot of this stuff on their own, to set things up, uh, ideally to like deploy things like a k-sql statement and have data come out, right? Uh, right now, um, the first iteration is basically that we allow people to write their own applications and deploy them, and also to submit uh, change requests to, uh, to our applications. So we see that quite a lot, actually. This is a list of pull requests that I just assembled. Uh, so this is the last number of pull requests. So I counted five different teams involved here with a lot of different integrations. So we, we are actually, so this kind of works, right? I mean, it, and some of them are not real uh, code fixes either. Like this one, for example, is, this guy is not a coder. He's just proposing it as something that he thinks like, this should be the output JSON format. And then the, the next one is uh, one of our team members actually doing the coding and doing the pull request for that. That, that kind of communication works well. And this, thing at the top here has sparked a lot of, you know, there's a, a new team member who doesn't know, or a different team who doesn't know Kafka streams and tries to do something based on our template, right? And then we have a lot of back and forth on how to, how to make this actually work. So that's worked pretty well. Our longer term is to have uh, much more support for self-serve, right? So we have our actually already an application. So again, Norse uh, mythology, right? <laughs> And I believe it's from Iceland, Gulfoss, or, yeah. Anyway, uh, so we have a registration of uh, different data providers uh, up and running, and that's going to be integrated uh, into our platform. So right now there's still some manual configuration of these kind of things, but we want to integrate with this uh, to fetch that data from there. But not only uh, this we're working on, uh, right now we're working on access control integrated into this as well, so the different sites and teams can themselves control who get access to what kind of data. Because right now that's also us administrating, like S3 access rights, for example. Uh, and then be able to set up kind of their routing of data. How, what kind of data do I want? Where do I want it to be sent? And things like this, right? This will be part of this uh, application. No idea, I'm doing for time. Um, okay, good. Um, so the future looks bright, right? We want to analyze all the data, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, so the, the goal is, of course, to build this platform and make this uh, sort of the central solution for data-driven applications in Chipset.
and have onboarding of more teams and sites as we move along. Uh, we are already we have a lot of ongoing efforts here now to onboard more media sites, for example, to this analytics stuff. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. Enough, not enough hours in the day, basically. Um, but there's also this other thing, the GDPR, that is eating up some time right now. So that's trying to, to balance this stuff, right? You want people to have access to the data, but you still want to protect data as well. So how do you balance this stuff? And a lot of the things uh, comes down to, I think, uh, well, there, there was a talk I, went, I attended uh, two weeks ago from, from LinkedIn talking about how they, how they handle this. And for them, it comes down to metadata, basically, about them. So that data about, about your data. Uh, you need to know what kind of data you're sending around. And here things like schemas come in, right? You need to know what data is personal and sensitive or you know, personal information and things like that. So you can deal with this in a more automated fashion. And this is some, uh, some of the things we're also working on now and trying to integrate into this platform. So with that, uh, that's about it for now. Uh, any questions? Thank you. All right, we have a few minutes for questions at least. Yes. Oh, uh, well, we're doing a lot of it ourselves, really. Uh, what For the streaming stuff, we're not... Uh, so, so the hard question we're looking at right now is deletion. But that's for the batch data, the stuff we're stored in stable stored in S3. And that's not really the uh, for the streaming solution. For the streaming solution, we have a short uh, retention time, so the data will basically be gone in time, right? Uh, so what we're looking at there is doing things like data minimization, making sure that... If you, if an, uh, so the downstream consumer should only have the data that they need for their processing purpose, right? Right now they're get, getting all of the events or, or the full event, things like that. So we already have uh, support in our platform for doing these kind of transformations. Uh, we'll just need to. Yeah, I mean on the on the firewalls on the ingest side we have everything, right? And then we split it up into different substreams uh, to go to different downstream consumers, but even so, we need to filter and transform the data to make sure that you can't do things like re-identification and things like that, right? And some, um, yeah, so there, there are a lot of things we need to do there. And also make sure we have a better story when it comes to access to the different parts of the data, yeah. But, uh, but we're currently building this ourselves. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, consumers of, of uh, JSON structures registering yeah. their own tests. Is this some, some homegrown thing you've, you've done, or is there something open source? Or something like that? Uh, it's homegrown, this, this data quality tooling, yes. Uh, and the, but the checks are, are they using JSTL? They're in, in JQ. Oh, JQ, yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, we're, we're using, uh, exactly, we're using JQ, which is a Java query, or uh, sort of JSON processing uh, language. And, and we also built something we call JSTL, which is a JSON transformation uh, language on top of this as well. So that's what we're using for, for transformations. Is, is it being heavily used? Uh, I mean, I, I, what I worry is that you, you throw about a, a, a bunch of events into a stream, yes. and then you're not sure who's uh, really reading it. Right. Maybe you have complexity in your application to do that, but nobody's actually listening. <laughs> uh, but, it, but if yeah. you have, you know, registered consumers who are actually testing yeah. uh, their expectation on the on the message. Well, I think we have a, actually a better sort of overview in our streaming platform because there we have explicitly set up these different com downstream consumers. Right? So we know that they're getting the data. We know we don't know exactly what they're doing with it, but we know at least they're consuming it some way. For the, the batch operation, when what we do is basically just write prepared file sets into S3. And yeah, we have a different component that can look at access logs and things and see who's actually reading it. But there's a, it's, it, there it's more like it's available and for some people and then exactly what they use it for, we don't know. Um, but yeah, we, we have a better, I think, for the integrations that we've done on the streaming side, we've interacted much more with the different teams that are doing this. We know much more about their use cases, in a sense. Yeah. But that's on sort of a talking to yeah. people basis. Right? Yeah. Which is, right, we're not at the self-serve thing yet, so we have yeah. had interactions with all of the different teams. But at some point, yeah, we will need to, to be able to scale this out on a company-wide scale, we need to be able to uh, offload the team, basically. To, uh, we can't 
handle all of this ourselves. Yeah. All right, one more question in the back. Yeah, so, so you have the old platform, the old streaming. Yes. You built the new Kafka one. Yeah. How did you move from the old to the new? Was it a big bang? Was there a side by side? Was uh, we've done this sort of stream by stream, yeah. We are still have some stuff running on the old one. Uh, specifically, the, the ad platform is moving over to the new one right now. They, uh, yeah, they're in the process of moving over. So we still have that and a couple of other things running on the old one. Uh, but the goal is to have the, the old one shut down. Well, I'm not sure if we're going to make uh, Q4, but at least Q1. Yes. Uh, Cost-wise, what does it look like for you, like moving away from Kinesis and like everything that Alvin did do and running yeah. on plus the rest of Azure Kafka? Uh, good question. I haven't actually looked at the numbers recently. I mean, so we, we, we looked at the numbers when we first started out and we had like this small cluster of, of three Kafka brokers and things, right? And that was kind of comparable to our Kinesis stream. And then we've added more stuff more consumers, more uh, processing applications and stuff. So it's not really comparable anymore because we're not, the, the Kinesis stream is just our event files. And that we could easily handle on, on a regular three node Kafka cluster. But now we added all of these other applications on top of it, which also produce new data, right? So we're not really at the 800 million events anymore. We're maybe a hundred times that, right? I'm not sure, but something along, along that, those lines. So, so we're, we're using, uh, Kafka for a lot more than we use Kinesis for at the moment. Uh, so it's not really comparable. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to end there. I think in the short term, it's more costly. In the long term, it should be cheaper as we learn how to operate it. And, and, uh, because Kinesis is quite expensive. Uh, yeah. Look at the price of it. Yeah, uh, I have personally had the experience before with Kinesis and also in terms of migrating to Kafka. Uh, but also, like, the maintenance is like lots of people. People who have yes. the cluster and everything. Mm -hmm. so and we have spent a lot of time, and we're, we're, we're yeah. using less and less time every week to maintain the cluster. Yeah. By the end yeah. of the year, it will run forever. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Probably. Yeah, I mean, but, the, uh, you know I mean. The, the last talk I got, uh, I, someone asked me about like how much time do you spend on operations on this, and uh, it varies. Like you got woken up like five times the other day, right? Or not woken up, but you got called five times. <laughs> Uh, so, it, but we've gotten this down from like our first couple of incidents. We had downtime of a couple of hours, maybe while we were looking at logs and trying to figure out what was going wrong and hitting some bugs and patching and getting things up again. And, and now we're typically, if something breaks, it's five or maybe ten minutes until we have things up and running again. Um, and as I said, we patched those that particular bug that we got bitten by the last couple of weeks. We patched that, and we haven't seen that since. Uh, that was the majority of those two and a half hours I mentioned uh, for, for October, at least. And uh, uh, also on the operations side, how Cassandra is treating you guys? Uh, yeah, I, I have actually, the Cassandra integration, I haven't touched, or I don't know. That, that's actually someone from one of the media sites that's written that, I think. Or no, is it? From uh, Search and Discovery, maybe. Cassandra cluster? Yes. Uh, we don't, we do don't do that, no. Uh, we just get the credentials and the address, and we mm. push yeah, so all of the downstream things are not run by us, right? So some, some other team provides us with their Kinesis stream that they want the data into or their Cassandra cluster or something, and then we just push it there. And that's up to them to have it working. That, that was kind of the problem in the old solution, right? Because if the Cassandra was down, it stopped all the other consumers as well. And then we had to add Hystrix, and you know, we dropped events, so Cassandra didn't get all of it, and they couldn't, yeah. Uh, it wasn't a good uh, situation. But right now, if when we move stuff, uh, the Cassandra sync also over to Kafka, then they can sort of handle this downtime stuff on their end and then just catch up when they're ready. Yeah. Right. Thank you.